Hey guys, Crackshot47 here. As you all know, I'm currently studying abroad in Hangzhou, China. And during one of our recent holidays a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to travel to the city of Nanjing. Nanjing has a very rich history, dating back far into China's imperial past. But it's also very significant to 20th century history as it pertains specifically to World War II. While I was there sightseeing with friends, we got a chance to visit the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall. And while I was only able to take a small clip of video, I have plenty of pictures to share with you as I guide you through one of the most haunting chapters of the Pacific War and examine some of the weapons used by Imperial Japan during this event, as well as the wider Sino-Japanese War as a whole. This video is a bit of a departure from my previous ones, as I will be meshing together the history from China's perspective of the Nanjing Massacre, along with a snapshot of Japan's historical use and development of select firearms used during this most tumultuous period. The Second Sino-Japanese War a tributary of the Second Great War, was the largest conflict fought in Asia during the 20th century and accounted for the majority of both military and civilian deaths of its entire Pacific theater, resulting in the deaths of up to 25 million Chinese civilians and over 4 million Chinese and Japanese soldiers. In July of 1937, five years after the invasion and establishment of a Japanese puppet state, Manchukuo, in Manchuria, the forces of the Empire of Japan invaded the Chinese mainland. The catalyst for the invasion was the Marco Polo Bridge incident, where on July 7th a dispute between Japanese and Chinese nationalist soldiers, underscored by increasing tensions between both states due to an increasing influx of Japanese troops in China's northern territories, exploded into armed conflict, serving as the opening salvo of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which would last from 1937 to 1945, the Sarajevo of the Pacific War. The war was initiated by the Japanese as, a part of a, as part of a much greater offensive to procure raw materials, food, and labor to fuel its imperial ambitions to dominate East and Southeast Asia. Yet Japan was largely stalled on China's coastal fringes, unable to penetrate deeper into the country. As a consequence, the territories Japan was able to conquer and secure, most notably Nanjing and Shanghai, fell under the administrative boot of tyrants keen to take their animosities out on the local population leading to several mass campaigns of rape, pillage, murder, and widespread suffering on an industrial scale. Thus a dark cloud descended upon China's coastal regions that wouldn't be dispelled until the Allies' victory over the Axis powers was codified on September 2, 1945. The Nanjing Massacre, also known as the Rape of Nanking, is widely considered the darkest chapter of the Japanese occupation. It took place during a six-week period beginning on December 13, 1937, the day forces from the Empire of Japan conquered China's former capital city, Nanjing. With the official Chinese cabinet establishing a new provisional government in Chongqing, deep in central China, following the fall of Shanghai to Japanese forces, and with the Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek shifting to a war of attrition strategy to draw Japanese forces deeper into China, the former capital city of Nanjing was left ill-guarded and ill-defended. The forces facing the imminent Japanese onslaught numbered at approximately 100,000, but many were ill-trained and under-equipped, while others, veterans of the previous battle, were still nursing their wounds from the Battle of Shanghai. Following Japanese demands issued on December 9th for the remaining Chinese soldiers to surrender, and in lieu of a response, Japanese forces laid siege to the city via rocket and artillery barrage, and subsequently invaded Nanjing while Chinese forces, ordered to retreat, tried in vain to run or blend in with the civilian populace, with many being killed on the spot or captured and summarily executed by their Japanese interlocutors. Some angered by their initial refusal to surrender. Others offended by their willingness to retreat in the face of battle. However, while thousands of captured soldiers served as the initial victims of the massacre, the civilian population was left to suffer the brunt of unimaginable horrors that defy and scale its deceptively short duration. Many of the official records kept by the Japanese regarding the Nanjing Massacre were either lost or destroyed during the war, or were burned shortly thereafter, and as such the official death toll remains unclear. However, most scholars, both in China and abroad, estimate that up to 300,000 people were killed during the six-week period in which the massacre took place, with entire families executed and hundreds of thousands of women forcibly molested by multiple Japanese soldiers, forced into becoming comfort women to serve as prostitutes for Japanese forces, were compelled into marriages with Japanese army officers. 
One particularly infamous story associated with the Nanjing Massacre involved two Japanese military officers, Toshiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda, both of the Japanese 16th Division, who engaged in a contest to see, well, which could be the first to behead 100 people with a katana. And when both surpassed their goal but could not determine a winner, they held another contest, this time aiming for 150 people. Following the war, both Mukai and Noda were tried and executed for their war crimes. This story is merely one of countless others that describe the depravity of those who took part in the Nanjing Massacre, many of which I cannot discuss on YouTube given the disturbing nature of, the, of their content. However, I will recommend a book, The Rape of Nanking by Iris Chang, to those who wish to know more about the details and first-hand accounts of the massacre. However, having read the book myself, I will caution that it most certainly is not for the faint of heart. As we move into the admittedly lighter-hearted, firearm-specific content of the video, I want to stress that this will not be a comprehensive overview of all the weapons used during the Sino-Japanese War. Rather, this will be a focused examination of some of the weapons featured at the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall, their history, and how the occupation of China and earlier conflicts up to that point helped to shape Japanese firearms development during the latter years of World War II from 1939 to 1945, focusing explicitly on infantry rifles like the Type 38 and Type 99. Now, I do say latter years of World War II because I'm kind of lumping in uh, the Japanese invasion of China, which really began with their invasion of Manchuria in the early 1930s. So I, uh, for, for us, it would be like 1941 to 1945, but for like the, the wider scope of the war, including the Sino-Japanese War, I'm basically saying like basically the early to mid-30s till about 1945. So first, we'll begin with the Type 38. Um, with regard to the Type 38, the Japanese Type 38 Arasaka rifle was developed from 1905 to 1906 as a consequence of the 1905 Russo-Japanese War, which, while on the whole, was a major military victory for Japan and the first instance of an Asian power defeating a major Western power, nonetheless revealed deficiencies in the early Type 30 pattern in use since 1897. The Type 38 rifle, chambered in the small yet effective 65 by 50 mm cartridge, was an improved derivative of early Mauser pattern rifles, it was heavily influenced by the Mauser 98, incorporating a notoriously strong action complete with anti-aircraft sights, a dust cover to mitigate the ingress of dirt into the receiver, and a five-round non-attachable internal magazine compatible for use with stripper clips. 6.5mm cartridge, while considered anemic relative to several other calibers in use during the period, was similar to those in use by the Norwegian and Italian militaries, producing little felt recoil and a flat, consistent trajectory at distance, lending itself well to accuracy. The rifle weighing in at just over 9 pounds, unloaded and 50 inches in overall length, was primarily carried by mainline troops in its long configuration, incorporating a front-mounted saber pattern bayonet, but was also issued in carbine length for rear echelon forces, which, in the later Type 44 configuration, sported an internal or er, an integral folding bayonet housed directly beneath the barrel, not dissimilar in function to that incorporated in the later Russian-designed SKS. Moving on to the next firearm on the list, the Type 11 light machine gun. The Type 11 light machine gun in use by the Empire of Japan from 1922 to 1945 was developed following World War II and, like the Type 38 Arasaka, was the result of lessons learned following the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Combat, ex combat experience on the ground during the Battle of Sendepu, which saw close-quarter fighting in Russian-occupied territories bordering the city of Mukden, Man Manchuria, helped to convince the Japanese military of the utility of sustained machine gun fire to facilitate troop advances. The Type 11, utilizing a 30-round hopper feed system chambered in 6.5mm and heavily based on the earlier M1909 French Hotchkiss, was designed to be compatible with the stripper clips used in the Type 38 Arasaka, allowing troops to continually feed up to six stripper clips into the gun manually. The advantage of the system was obvious. The hopper feed system, shown in the images, uh, can be reloaded quickly without needing, to be, without needing to be detached from the gun, while a machine gun crew or a lone gunner could keep the gun running with ammunition carried on the person of each soldier. Despite this advantage, there were clear drawbacks to the system. Because of the feeding system, because it was open to the elements, the ingress of dirt and debris was unavoidable, and the weight of the side-mounted loading system when fully loaded made the weapon awkward and unbalanced. Additionally, the distinct curvature of the stock, coupled with its lack of balance made the weapon extremely difficult to reload during assault charges. While this system of loading was fairly conventional in the years following World War I, it was nonetheless outpaced by 
advanced by advances in machine gun technology that allowed for greater volumes of sustained fire utilizing belts and magazines. The latter style being copied by the Japanese in later heavy machine gun and light machine gun designs following World War II, especially with the U.S. influence in Japan in the post-war period. Pictured in front of the Type 11 is the Type 92 heavy machine gun, entering service with the Empire of Japan in 1932 and remaining in use until the 1950s. The Type 92, like the Type 11 and Arasaka series of rifles, was not only used by the Imperial Japanese forces and their collaborators during the occupation of China, but also saw heavy use by both the Nationalist and Communist Chinese forces, alongside the Hengang 88 and Chiang Kai-shek rifles more closely associated with the Chinese military and resistance forces, both during the war against Japan and in, subsequent Chinese, in the subsequent Chinese civil war that followed. The Type 92 was a scaled-up version of the Type 3 that preceded it, and was chambered in seven to 7.7 by 58 millimeter cartridge. It was gas operated and was based heavily on the M1914 Hotchkiss. And like the Type 11 light machine gun utilized a 30 round uh, stripper clip feed system. The Type 92 had a stated range of approximately 4,500 meters but was intended for more practical use with an 800 with a firing rate between 400 and 450 rounds per minute and necessitated a three man crew to operate due to its weight and additional components, such as a removable bipod system, to aid in more quickly changing firing position during troop advances or retreat. One quite unusual feature of this weapon is the placement of its front and rear sights, which are offset to the right. This was to facilitate the potential use of scopes to uh, increase range and the addition of anti-aircraft sights, if needed, allowing the weapon to retain iron sights capability while also making it easy for the gun to shift combat roles. Like the Type 11 light machine gun, the Type 92 had a number of problems directly attributable to its operating system. Unlike belt-fed designs, the use of stripper clips admittedly simplified to a single long strip at this point, and a 30-round maximum, maximum capacity made sustained firing extremely difficult, a problem exacerbated by the weapon's chief flaw. Its open feed system made the weapon susceptible to mud and dirt entering the action and rendering the weapon inoperable in all but the most sterile of combat condition, uh, conditions. This was further complicated by the use of an internal oil pump to lubricate each round ready to fire, making the weapon a certifiable dirt magnet. Despite these flaws, however, the Type 92 was an effective weapon, as long as it was sufficiently maintained and kept out of the dirt, and continued to soldier on in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, used by the forces of the DPRK and the Viet Cong, respectively. As we segue into firearms development, we're going to be focusing pretty much entirely on the Type 38 and Type 99 Arasakas. Following several years of battlefield experience in China, beginning with Japan's annexation of Manchuria in the early 1930s and its invasion of China in 1937, which led up to the Nanjing Massacre, Japanese Imperial forces came to the conclusion that their 6.5mm cartridge, in use for several decades up to that point, was obsolete and sought to upgrade to a new pattern of rifle that would be both shorter and lighter and would incorporate the more powerful 7.7mm cartridge already in use in the Type 92 heavy machine gun. This new rifle, designed in 1938 and adopted between 1939 and 1940, was designated the Type 99. Like the Type 38, it featured a dust cover and anti-aircraft sights, but added an, in my opinion, fairly useless monopod that was more, than off, more often than not abandoned by troops in the field due to its tendency to drop out of its position on the forward end of the stock under sustained fire. And by sustained fire, I mean like two or three rounds. Unlike the Type 38, which was longer, heavier, and incorporated the light recoiling 6.5mm round, the Type 99, weighing it at 8.4 pounds, being 6 inches shorter than its predecessor, and firing a much stouter round, was a shoulder thumper. That said, both rifles were quite effective at distance and were among the most well-made rifles of World War II, last-ditch rifles notwithstanding. In fact, like the Type 92, both the 6.5mm Type 38 and 7.7mm uh, Type 99 rifles continued to soldier on long after Japan surrendered on board the Mighty Mo in 1945, and alongside other Mauser pattern rifles, their bark can still be heard today on battlefields the world over. Living history of a time increasingly few remember. I want to thank everyone for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the content of this video and found it enlightening. Going forward, I plan to do more content of this style, albeit with more video and less pictures, as I continue my travels in China, 
and I hope you will accompany me on this journey to explore the historical bedrock that breathes life into some of the very guns like the Type 38 and Type 99 that many of us love to own, shoot, and collect. Again, thank you for watching, and if you have any suggestions for follow-up videos, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you liked what you saw. That's all for this video. Crackshot47 out.